Wow. Right, thank you. Hang on, let me get rid of that message. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, for those who have only just joined us, I'm the, the woman with the long name. N uh, Janet is the easy bit. It's Niepokojczycka. My father was Polish. And when I discovered that Charles Edward Stewart was half Polish, I sort of felt the connection before I'd even started. Um, as Stephen has just mentioned, uh, I, I don't do PowerPoint. I'm not into the modern technology. I have enough trouble with Zoom, but I have been a speaker since 1983. I've given uh, and continue to give talks on 30 different subjects, one of which is about the days of the pack horse. Uh, I've always been uh, mad keen on horses and ponies, um, but uh, it wasn't until the 1980s that that particular topic came uh, to mind. I'll come back to that in just a moment. I'd like to say that behind me um, are some images which you may or may not be able to see too clearly. I also have something rather nice there, which is actually is my pack saddle. Um, and I will pick that up later and show it to you because that pack saddle went with me and my pony for a thousand miles in 1991. Um, but as I said, it was um, the 1980s actually that set me off on my interest in the days when four hooves ruled the roads. And in the second part of this, or towards the end of this talk, of course, I am going to refer as best I can because the information is sadly lacking as far as I've found, but I will refer to um, Bonnie Prince Charlie and his army as he, as he came down through England and then returned. Um, but uh, for now, I just want to give you some background about the days of the pack horses so that we can then see what um, things were like, both uh, in earlier times, but also at the time that Charles was coming through the country. And it was only through rereading my notes that I uh, got a surprise in the number of pack horses and activities that were going on. But let's uh, go to 1983 because I have to blame this book. I hope you can see that. This is Saddle Tramp in the Lake District. And if I hadn't have read this book, I wouldn't be sitting here now talking to you about pack horses. It's by a Cumbrian man called Robert. Well, um, he lives in Cumbria now. He wasn't born there. Uh, lived most of his life in the county. And as you can see from the cover, uh, this book is about a journey that he did. Um, he did it in the 1970s um, at uh, a time in his life when he was having a lot of problems with his business and his personal life. So he took to the hills, the fells, as we call them in Cumbria, uh, with two ponies, one to carry him, one to carry all his camping gear. So he had a pack pony with him and he ended up writing that book. And I read it in the spring of 1983. And I must say I was hooked, uh, not only because it, involved horses and ponies but it told me about the journey but it also told me about the history of some of the tracks that he was using uh, and that set me off so that six months having read that I was doing my own little saddle trap journey I don't know whether you can see that but that is me on the last day of a, a 10 day journey where it rained every day bar one <laughs> uh, I took uh, these two wonderful ponies and uh, we didn't uh, travel that far, only 60 miles, but we raised 800 pounds for two local charities. And then I got really hooked on these journeys. Now at that stage, I'm riding the pony and leading a pack pony. Um, on my second journey in 1985, again, I was riding and I covered 200 miles around the Lake District. But in 1987, I decided I really wanted to be a pack horse woman and um, take it a bit more seriously. So my pony, William Wordsworth and I walked 400 miles around the Lakeland Fells and we managed in uh, fine weather because we had atrocious weather in June 87, we managed to climb England's highest mountain. 
please bear in mind that I had been told this could not be done. The pony wouldn't get up there. Oh, well, <laughs> and not only do I have many illustrations of it, I've got my dad's video recording of it as well. Uh, so yes, um, we did get to the top of England's highest mountain and, and it, that journey taught me a lot. Um, it, it, it gave me a good idea as to what a pony could do. And um, did we go scrambling in some difficult places? Um, well, after that journey and having had a terrible, terrible weather, I said to myself, well, that's it, you know, done my bit. And yet, oh dear, in 1991, I did one final big journey, 1,000 mile walkies with another pony called Royal Mail. Now, whether this will show up or not, but this is a newspaper cutting of me looking very strange, I know. Uh, but there we are, Roy and I, I've got a whole raft of uh, images from various um, productions, including, look, we made it into Hello magazine. That's not bad, is it? We also made it onto various television channels and radio uh, broadcasts. Uh, and that was a, a journey that was nearly 10 weeks long. And um, the longest day on that journey was 27 miles and it nearly killed me, but the pony was fine. So remember, I'm walking it um, along with, with that pony. And if you want to know a bit more about any of those journeys, um, do feel free uh, if we've got time to, to ask me at the end. But as I say, it did give me first-hand experience. That's really what I'm, why I've mentioned all this because I, I know I'm in amongst uh, an august uh, <laughs> set of people who have a wonderful knowledge on a number of subjects, but I do feel I, I know a little bit about uh, the pack horses and, and what they could and couldn't do. We've been using uh, horses as sort of beasts of burden, if you will, for, for many centuries. Well, from probably from the time that we actually domesticated the horse in the prehistoric periods, uh, at least uh, going back to the Bronze Age. Um, to as late as the early 1900s, can you believe, there were still some pack ponies um, operating in the north of England. And when you look at the landscape in the north of England, uh, and indeed southern Scotland, it, it's a bit corrugated, isn't it? There's, the, you know, lots of lumps and bumps and hills and valleys, um, which meant that four hooves um, were ideal for that sort of a journey. And it's not just in this country that uh, we have been using pack horses for a very long time. Uh, they've been used worldwide and indeed in many countries are still being used, uh, as you'll hear a bit later, today. Um, going right back to the earliest times, as I say, if only I could show you my slide, I have a wonderful slide of uh, an alabaster wall frieze from Iraq and it dates to 640 BC and on that uh, plaque uh, uh, the detail of the pack animal and its harness is, well, it's, uh, it's absolutely brilliant. You can, you can see everything very, very clearly. Well, over time, uh, pack horses have carried all manner of goods, uh, just about everything and anything that you can think of. In the medieval period, wool and salt were particularly important. Trying to you know, pinpoint any actual information about all of these things is quite difficult. But amazingly, in Southampton, we have some brokerage accounts um, which go back to the end of the 1400s and into the 1500s. And these accounts actually tell us about men uh, arriving with their pack loads and what they're bringing in and what they're leaving with. Um, so this was not a one-way journey. And we're talking, I'm talking now about pack ponies from the county we call Cumbria today, going to Southampton with wool. This is in the medieval period and coming back with imported items like figs, raisins, uh, oranges, dye stuffs, alum and canvas, for instance. We know this because there are actual records surviving from this time, which is quite astonishing. Um, and we know that predominantly these Cumbrian pack horse men were arriving with wool 
and it was going abroad because in the mid 14 and 1500s, uh, cheap woolen cloths from the north and the Welsh border, that they were finding a market abroad. Um, much of it was going into Italy, for instance. So that's amazing. I rather like the, um, the note that on the 4th of June, 1554, uh, Kendall men who arrived with uh, 10 packs of cloth were too drunk to tell their names. <laughs> um, there was one family that seemed to have uh, appeared again and again, the Bateman family who lived uh, just to the east of Kendall and had not just one or two pack ponies, they were like the Eddie Stobarts of their day. They have many pack horses. And Stephen Bateman is recorded in these brokerage accounts arriving every year from 1492 to 1546. But the most, uh, you know, that's pretty amazing, that journey all the way down there and back again. But what's more amazing, and you might think, well, they went in the better weather, but no, not always. Uh, some of these men are arriving in the winter months as well. The mind boggles, isn't it? Um, it it's quite incredible. But what I will say with all of that and from what I have learned and, and I've written it on my notes in capital letters is that a horse can carry a load where it cannot pull a load. Um, so that pony that went with me to the top of Scarfell Pike could never have pulled a cart up there, could he? It would just be impossible. And uh, steep gradients and carts don't, don't go very well. Uh, yes, as uh, Charlie and his army, or more likely uh, it was uh, Lord George Murray, wasn't it, was to find out, particularly when they went through the Shap and Kendall areas. We'll come back to that a bit later as well. So um, they carried a whole range of goods. They, the pack ponies in times past have carried um, all sorts of uh, commodities from mines and quarries, for instance, where those mines and quarries are in an area not accessible by cart. So if it's halfway up a very steep hillside, you can load up a pack pony, but you, you, know, you might have to bring those ponies down to a cart in the valley bottom. Um, so lead and copper and iron ores were carried by pack ponies, slate and coal and lime and you name it, they carried it. But they also carried perishable goods. Think of fish, for example. Now then, this is quite amazing. Um, fish from the Cumbrian coast arriving <laughs> down in Billingsgate fish market ready to eat and you think taken there by pack horse and you're thinking don't be silly well will you believe Daniel Defoe he's writing in 1724 not long before Charles arrived this is what he's saying he's saying that the Workington men so Workington is on the west coast of Cumbria carry salmon salmon fresh as they take them up to London upon horses which changing often go night and day without intermission and as they say out go the post for that the fish comes very sweet and good to London where the extraordinary price they yield from two shillings and sixpence to four shillings a pound this is in the 1700s it pays very well for their carriage and they do the same from Carlisle well if, if we thought that invented the Pony Express. Well, it, it seems we had our version, doesn't it? Because Dan has told us how they managed to get those fish to London fresh as they take them, because he's saying that the load being put onto fresh horses 24-7. And by that manner, yes, you could get your salmon to market fresh, which uh, is quite astonishing isn't it we're perhaps thinking you know pack courses it's a very slow lumbering but not a bit of hmm. so uh so um um perishable commodities particularly fish um liquids were carried well uh and i wonder if you know what sort of liquid might be carried by this miserable looking mule very sour face and it's this is 
it's dating from the the 166 and actually it the vinegar cellar in London can you believe there's an awful lot of detail on this um this illustration I don't know if you can see we can clearly see barrels on either side of the pack can't we we can we can see that this mule has got a bridle on and if you could see this image on my screen as a slide would also see that this mule is shod and that's something often asked were pack horses shod most certainly yes if they're working pretty much full-time carrying heavy loads heavy i'm not into magic but how 16 stem for you i can't convert that somebody can uh, but you, 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 they're going to need to be shod if they're doing a lot of heavy work if it's, it's more part-time and then more gentle ground hmm, maybe you might think that this man's world it's it's physical work hard work loading and unloading walking in all weathers with these ponies maybe occasionally riding uh, if if uh, your pack horse train has got 20 or 30 ponies in it uh, sometimes illustrations show that there were outriders going with the pack horse train again bead we'll come back to that later um but uh but it was wholly a man's world because there are documentary uh, evidences of women doing this as well incredibly they there can't have been many of them and Gosh, they must have been tough, wasn't they? I want to know what they wore. Did they wear trousers or their swirling skirts? As you can see on my illustration, I'm afraid I, there's no way I was going to be climbing over steep passes and staggering through bogs with, uh, with a swirling skirt on. I wore trousers and one wonders. This illustration, dear, which is, oh, there we are, is a postcard. It's uh, showing a, a page from Czechoslovakia. She looks rather forbidden, but I, I, she is a woman. She now does have a skirt on, and we can see that she's got two donkeys laden with wood by the looks of it. Uh, so that's from abroad, but I have an image of an English um, pack horse woman, in fact, considered by some to perhaps be the last. Uh, woman who operated commercially uh, with her ponies in her day. Here she's much older and in her dotage and she's just got the one donkey. This is Mary Alice Hartley or her nickname was Ailsa O'Fusses and she operated in the Clitheroe Rochdale area in the 1800s just as her father before her. In her heyday she had a whole string, string of pack horses and she was carrying coal and lime and other items uh, in, in that area. But as you can see, much later on, she's down to the one donkey. Um, Mary Alice Hartley died in 1879 and she's buried apparently in the churchyard at Whitworth. Although I've been, of course, I wanted to pay my respect. I couldn't find her grave maybe at least not a marked grave maybe headstones would have been you know too expensive for the likes of a pack horse woman i don't know but um whenever i've done my journeys i've thought about mary alice hartley or ailes officers but they must have been tough women is, is all i can say who was was doing these journeys and you know apart from men and women how was it all organized this is the information i can't necessarily tell you much about, but we do seem to have each end of the scale. So we have the big time operators like the Batemans in the medieval period who, who had many pack horses. Uh, and here I've got a little example, um, 1788, that's the Bonnie Prince Charlie that came over. One company is sending 70 pack horses a day from Liverpool to Manchester, return, 70 a day. Um, and other, um, uh, you know, sort of, it, you need to look at wills and inventories. And sometimes these sort of things can be picked up where um, the, the said person who has passed on has left a number of pack horses. 
So you've got your big time operators who could move a lot of goods, of course. If you've got, you know, 20, 30, 40 pack horses, um, you, you are going to move some commodities there. But at the other end of the scale, you've got your individuals who perhaps just had one pack horse or maybe two. And again, in 1713, we've got a Sheffield man died and he left four ponies and pack saddles and panniers. Uh, he'd used them to carry coal. And those items were worth six pounds and two shillings. He might have been a badger, um, but I don't know for sure. A badger, not the furry animal. Uh, the badger was an itinerant hawker uh, who often plied the, their trade using a pack horse, obviously to carry their goods or maybe more than one. Badgers often worked on a fixed circuit going market town to market town with a fixed commodity. So you might be a corn badger or a, a cheese badger or whatever. And it's rather interesting to note that um, whatever the case, these badgers, I think, must have been up to no good in, in, in certain areas because the government um, brought out a statute to control them in 1563. Uh, and suddenly you had to have a license and be a householder and have this and have that and somebody stand surety for you. So maybe the badgers were being a bit naughty, selling outside the markets. Um, whatever the case, a great long list of controls on the badgers, but right at the bottom it says northern badgers are exempt from this. Like it. <laughs> so goodness knows what they were getting up to. What about the type of horses and animals that were being used? Again, you see, it, 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 they, they don't say in, in anything that I've read, there's very little evidence of um, the, the, the breed or the type of animal. Again, we can go to um, illustrations, but the, 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 certainly the medieval illustrations don't really <laughs> help us um, with, with the, the animal type. Um, but, you know, in this country, we're very lucky. We have some wonderful native breeds. Um, and here's one of them. Oh, well, I'm, I'm with two of them. These are Dale's ponies here, practicing for my first journey around the Lake District. So these are Yorkshire ponies. Um, and the, the pony that I took to London was a fell pony, very similar, but slightly smaller. And both the Fells and the Dales um, are ideal pack animals. They're very hardy and tough. They can work all day, live on next to nothing. They're handy because they're not big. You don't want a big rangy thoroughbred type horse for a pack animal. Just loading and unloading is just not gonna be the good. And you want something relatively quiet, <laughs> not something that's jiggling around. So, you know, our native breeds, um, why not? Um, they, they have made a, a, an ideal pack animals. Now, in some documents, Galloways are mentioned, or Gals. Um, that, as a breed, doesn't exist now, but Daniel Defoe certainly rated the Galloways, uh, so one would presume that they, they did once exist. And it would seem that Galloways and certainly Fells and Dales and maybe some of our other native breeds, but I haven't worked with those, had one thing very important for a pack horse, a natural fast gait, i.e. a fast walk, a walk that they can keep up hour after hour. And if you're applying your trade, carrying a load on the back of your pony, that's exactly what you want, don't you? Something that can keep up that pace. Um, Welsh ponies, small and fast, and 1795, a, a writer is saying that they run up and down the hills near Manchester as sure a foot as ghosts, goats, not ghosts. <laughs> um, and I can't, uh, I can't see why we couldn't have been using our native ponies, but we do know that in the sort of uh, 1700s and probably before then, there was such a demand for animals like this that they were being imported from Europe. So we, we're probably bringing in new strains, new breeds, which will be mixing with ours and so on. But 
you certainly want something handy, I would suggest, if you, if you want a pack horse. Well, if you've got your animal, before you put your load on it, there's <laughs> something else that's very important that you need, and that is a pack saddle. And, and that's absolutely crucial um, because if that pack saddle doesn't sit right, you're going to have all sorts of problems, slipped loads, sore backs, and yeah. So um, because pack saddles are made of wood and sort of padding, archaeologically, they don't survive uh, very often. They're, there are some in museums around the country, but they're few and far between. Here's uh, some illustrations from a little booklet of some different types of pack saddles and indeed some, um, well, these are called hots, if I remember rightly, but panniers, um, containers to put your goods in. Those are really going to depend on what you're carrying. Um, if it's the uh, something like uh, lead or copper ore, yes, you're going to need these panniers. If it's uh, wool cloth, then it's like a big sack over, the, over the, the pack saddle. And these pack saddles, if you look at them, all follow the same design. They're a high arch over the horse's back. Um, am I coming to my saddle? Yes, maybe, wait a minute. <laughs> um, but first, a couple of images. Gosh, these these look a bit frightening. These two ladies, but these <laughs> these are on Holy Island in the 1800s. And if you can see them, I'm trying not to get the reflection. There we go. Uh, they're with their donkeys, and you can see they're on the shore, uh, and uh, they've got these open panniers oh. there. Donkeys certainly seem to appear on a number of medieval manuscripts. Uh, so we, we were using those in this country, but because they're a smaller animal, um, I'm not sure if they could keep up the speed of, of um, you know, a, a slightly larger, uh, like a decent sized pony. And they don't seem to appear so much in later images. Now I've got some Highland ponies here. <laughs> And Highlands are, are just like our fells and dales, are wonderful, uh, very sure footed, strong. Oh gosh, I don't think this is showing up too well. Oh, trying not to get the glint. So there we go, it's a bit better. Uh, the middle one, as you can see, is also carrying uh, panniers. Saddles uh, seem to vary a little bit in shape. My pack saddle, well, first of all, I'll, I'll do this. Don't want to budge things too much and you probably don't know what you're looking at and I'm going to see if I can lift it up because it's very simple that my pack saddle was made especially for me for my journey to London in 1991 but saddles like this appear in illustrations going back centuries and saddles like this can still be found in many Mediterranean countries today and it, the reason of course is that it so, so simple. Uh, now then, <laughs> we've got two side panels and four cross pieces. Can you see? I'll set the bell off because it's probably driving you all crazy. We'll come to bells. And that's going to sit again. So it's forming that high arch over the horse's back. You do not want weight pressing on the horse's spine just as you wouldn't if you were carrying something heavy, the weight you want on the muscles on either side, but certainly not on the horse's spine, just as a modern riding saddle has that gully down. Again, it's keeping the weight off the spine. Um, so this pack saddle is made of Lake District Oak, and uh, it was made for me, as I say, especially for the journey, uh, and it worked brilliantly, I have to say. I didn't have any problems with it at all. So that's um, a modern <laughs> pack saddle, but I thought you might be interested. Oops, let me just show you these. And this is a bit difficult to show you because I was given parts of a real pack saddle dating from I don't know when, but we think it's a donkey saddle. Here's that high arch. We're missing side pieces. So I've got four of these pieces. Look, they come apart. They notch together. <laughs> um, 
and they came from the United Arab Emirates and were found under a sand dune. But the amazing thing, and I've never ever seen this before, how I can show you, I don't know. But as I'm talking, can you see that the wood is decorated? So somebody has gone to the trouble of decorating their pack saddle. Can you see that? It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and why somebody would do that, you just wonder, don't you, if there's a story there, if only these two, these four pieces of wood could talk. Uh, but I treasure these. I was given these by a gentleman from Wakefield, an elderly gentleman who came to one of my talks on pack courses and told me I've, I've got something you might like and produced those and gave them to me. Um, and uh, well, <laughs> And uh, that was all he could tell me, found under a sand dune, um, I think he said in the 1930s, that's when they were discovered, but how long they've been there, I don't know. United Arab Emirates, wow. <laughs> Tracks and trails. Well, Northern England and many other places, uh, lumpy, bumpy, hilly, difficult landscape. It's no wonder we were using pack horses up here far longer than probably anywhere else in this country. Ah, uh, we've got a quote. Where are we? Whoops. Why is that? Oh, I was doing so well. Where's my piece of paper with my quote gone? We got it all over. Oh, yes. No, no. That's OK. Um, if we are to believe these quotes, then it would seem that wheeled transport was pretty uncommon in various places. So, for instance, in 1637, a traveller in Cornwall found it to be destitute of anything that is moved upon wheels. All carriage is laid upon horses' backs, either in trusses or on crooks or uh, in panniers. 1749, that's an interesting date. Now, not a cart to be found in Northumberland. I think I know why. <laughs> I've just realised that's an interesting date, isn't it? <laughs> um, yes. Could it be that Charlie's army had purloined them all <laughs> heading back north? I know he didn't quite go through Northumberland, but yes, that's quite funny. And 1723, when a load of coals was brought in a cart to a village near Glasgow, a crowd of people went out to see the wonderful machine. They looked with surprise and returned with astonishment. In other words, they weren't used to seeing a cart or a wheeled vehicle. They were used to seeing four hooves delivering things. That's quite amazing, isn't it? Celia Fines writing and traveling indeed at the end of the 1600s. And she's talking about uh, riding around the Lake District. Here can be no carriages, but very narrow ones, uh, like wheelbarrows, that with a horse they convey their fuel and all things else. They also use horses on which they have a sort of pannier, some closed and some open, and they, they strew, uh, that they strew full of hay, turf and lime and dung and everything else they would use. And the reason is plain from the narrowness of the lane. Abundance of horses I see all about Kendall streets with their burden, 1696. So, uh, I mean, there probably were carts in Northumberland in 1749, but it would appear that they weren't a common sight. Right, pack, pack animals then. Um, many of the routes that they were using were um, off, the, off the routes maybe that the wheeled vehicles were, were traveling on. And uh, some of these routes are sometimes called causes uh, from the French word causi, C-A-U-S-I, which means a raised or paved way. Now then just to show you what I mean. Now then, can we see this? You see this pack horse, this badger even, I think. Can you see what he's walking along? 
Uh, it looks like a base of a wall, but it isn't. This is a horse causey. So you've got slabs, single slabs of stone laid down uh, along the route. In other words, these were never meant for wheeled vehicles, were they? You, you know, they're far too narrow for a cart. So these were specifically laid down for the pack horses, and they are very numerous. Even today, still in the north of England, you can find these very popular with walkers now. Even in the wet weather, you see, you keep your feet dry. And of course, that's the whole reason they were put down, because they're going across miry ground, damp ground, uh, and it means that you and your pack horse are going to get through at the end of the day and take your goods to market. I've just found another quote uh, about the um, lack of wheeled uh, traffic. 1760, before this date, no road for wheeled traffic um, was found between Liverpool and Manchester. So you couldn't take a cart between Liverpool and Manchester, apparently, before 1760, the mind boggles. I hope all this is giving you an insight into um, how Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobite army moved, <laughs> and especially when we think about the weather that they were moving in. Um, Travelling was not easy in the 1700s. So, um, ah, quotes, quotes. That's uh, most terrible of roads, even uh, relatively, oops, excuse me, relatively recently, the Shap Road was really quite well known. Sorry, I'm just looking for my quotes as we speak. Um, and uh, we, I know through reading um, the, uh, hmm, the writings of, of uh, Charlie and his army traveling down, down towards Kendall, it, it seems as if the going was pretty bad even in 1745. Well, in 1634, a traveller said that uh, travelling between Penrith and Kendal through such ways as we hope we shall never again, being no other than climbing and stony, nothing but bogs and mires. Um, we were forced to keep to these narrow, loose, stony base ways, though never so troublesome and dangerous. On we went to Kendal, desiring much to be released of those difficult and dangerous ways, which for the space of eight miles traveling a slow marching pace, we passed over nothing but a most confused mixture of rocks and bogs. My goodness me, it doesn't paint a very good picture of Shap, does it? But um, uh, even in relatively recent times with our motorised transport, the road up over Shap was, um, well, it was nationally recognised that in the winter you could be in big trouble going up there and lorries have been marooned in the snow. Um, but, you know, with, with the, well, with global warming and better transport, that doesn't seem to happen quite the same. I've lost my other quote. Where's it gone? Oh, yes. There we are. It's only a little bit more of the same. It's um, 1729 uh, and it's concerning the Shap area. One travel on horseback <laughs> um, from noon until half past seven at night, riding nonstop. And it, it took him all that length of time tr to traverse 18 long miles on the vilest road up and down that can be, he said. Hmm, gosh, right. So yes, in some areas, the roads were in quite a state. If you think about it, the Romans that built some roads in this country, but when they left, really not much attention was given to, to roads until the, the, um, the origins of the turnpike trusts where the roads began to be mended again. But, but in between those times, um, just reading accounts of, of people traveling, it does sound quite dire. Uh, two sorts of structures that you're going to encounter on your, your trail um, and are very important. Um, you are going to have to cross water at some stage. And so you need a bridge. And again, um, if you're just going with a pack horse, you don't need a great big bridge, do you? 
pack horse bridges aren't big, i.e. they're narrow. They're, you know, uh, about a three foot wide uh, and they don't need high sides on them either. That wouldn't work. If you think of a narrow bridge with high sides, how would your laden pack pony get through? So pack horse bridges tend not to have sides on them. Here's the lovely bridge at the head of Wasdale Head. Look, so no sides on that. Um, but you are going to need bridges. It would seem that the early bridges, pack horse bridges, were made of wood, but obviously in times of flood, they could get washed away. And it's interesting to note that the period of uh, the biggest number of stone replacement bridges being built in the north of England is between 1650 and 1750. Is that a clue to the height of the Pacos era, perhaps? The other thing that's probably even more important, um, but if you're working horses hard, they need to drink. And so drinking troughs, stone drinking troughs can be found on many of these old routes, even those that have now been turned into roads. So access to water would have been very important indeed. Now, many images of pack ponies seem to show them carrying bells and you, you heard <laughs> some bells earlier when I was moving my pack saddle around. Uh, there's a little illustration here. I'm looking, I'm, I'm having great fun with this, but can you see these laden animals? They've got panniers, um, but then they've got these strange archers over their backs with little dingly dangly things and there's a whole train of them for a start. This is supposedly showing pack horses in the southern Pennines. Um, but we know that some pack horses carry bells. Again, in the museums, you can find bell collars up and down the country. There's a little children's rhyme that goes, bell horses, bell horses, what time of day? One o'clock, two o'clock, three and away. Bell horses, bell horses, what time of day? Four o'clock, five o'clock, six and away. And so that goes on. But that's not only suggesting they carry bells, but it's also just suggesting you might see them at any time of the day, indeed. Um, but why carry bells? Well, a warning to other road users. If you're coming down into a town or a village through those narrow ways with your pack ponies, somebody else is coming the other way, somebody's got to give way. So oh. maybe it was a little bit of that. Um, if you're out at night with your pack horses going across the fells, it, it's, if you can hear the bells ringing, you at least know where they are. Uh, but also bells, red ribbon, my bells look have got red ribbon on them. Uh, a sprig of rowan in your hat, um, a whole stone round your neck, a stone with a hole in it. All of these things might keep away the evil spirits. <coughs> because traveling in those days was considered quite dangerous. And if you wanted to keep the witches and nasty things away, and you might want to do that at the end of this month, um, then you took precautions. So all of those things uh, apparently would save you from, from the nasty things getting you. But you might not want to announce your presence with bells if it, during a war, and of course, we've been using horses and ponies and donkeys in warfare, presumably ever since we domesticated them. Uh, the other people who wouldn't want to, who might use pack horses and wouldn't want to announce their presence are the smugglers. And there are all sorts of stories around our coastal counties of smugglers making use of pack horses rather than carts for the very reason your pack horses can go off the main roads <laughs> um, and they can go much faster than a cart. That's really important. But yes, we've been using horses in warfare for a very long time. Um, and we particularly used rather a lot of them in uh, the First World War. Something like eight million, gosh, went to war and a million of them died. Uh, just trying to show you a couple of images from my book. Whoops, can you just about make out at the top there's a whole line. I'm, I'm struggling here because I'm having to look above the book. Um, and somewhere down below there's a laden, there we go, 
carrying gun parts, but and we, as I say, we've been making use of animals um, in in uh, warfare. Well, all through the centuries, and if you think about the conditions during the First World War, uh, in those dreadfully muddy, muddy, horrible places, uh, the mind boggles. Really, it's um, gosh. So, um, just before we consider the little bit of information we do have about the Jacobites army, um, well, in Britain and indeed all over the world now, we've become motorised and recognised, haven't we? We don't need pack horses and we don't see them over here really anymore. However, in many countries, that isn't necessarily the case and many poor people still rely on laden animals uh, for their livelihood. And there's a little scene here from China with a wee pack pony. <laughs> I'm not sure, I think he's carrying bricks, uh, but can you see what he's walking on? Because it looks like a horse corsi, which is quite funny to see that in another country, it's high above the paddy fields there. And uh, what else we got? I think this is in either India or Pakistan. Goodness me, how heavy is that load? Because this is river gravel, look, filling those panniers. That will be incredibly heavy. And one more. These last two images are from uh, the magazine uh, that the charity called The Brook sent to me. I've been a big supporter of Brook for a number of years because they work in many countries around the world uh, helping the owners of these animals to improve the lives of, of working equines that are carrying uh, such in, in incredible loads and well without their working horses and ponies those people would go hungry. Well um, so what do we know about Charlie? Um, when, I, when I agreed to do this talk a, a year ago I, I thought, oh yes, I'll start rooting through all my books, but uh, I was to be uh, <laughs> a little bit disillusioned because I didn't find an awful lot, I have to say. Um, please bear with me a minute. Uh, so, um, we do know that pack horses were incredibly common in use in the 1700s. So they would have been seen by the army. Well, in fact, more than that, uh, because we know that they had pack horses with them. I shall read you those quotes in a minute, uh, albeit it's very few and far between. But in 1750 in Cumbria, it, only yeomen and larger occupiers could boast of carts. The produce of the farms, hay, corn and peat were all brought in either on railed sledges but and the more portable goods um, by pack horse and coal and lime were conveyed by this last method across the miry moors and commons where tracks instead of roads existed till near the end of the 1700s and many persons remember the very common use of the pack horse both as a general carrier from town to town and for grain to the mill or market and manure, etc., on the farm. Mm. So, uh, pack horses there certainly were, and it seems as if there were a lot of them around. Um, Kendal, where, where the army actually stayed, didn't they, overnight in, in Kendal? Well, at the time that Charlie was there, there were more than 350 pack horses a week going in and out of there, according to the book I've got. Um, and uh, some of these animals were traveling to local destinations, but others, uh, 20 plus pack horses a week were going to and from London. Uh, that's to and from Kendal to London. <laughs> I've been not been able to find an awful lot, as I said, about uh, the use of pack horses in the Jacobite army, but I do have a couple of snippets for you. Oh. 
So from um, Robert Chambers' book, History of the Rebellion, 1745-6, and their baggage was promptly transported by about 150 wains, a wain is a cart, and as many sumpter horses. Now that might not be a phrase you know, but sumpter is a very old word for a pack horse or indeed a, 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 you know, a person that goes with the pack horses. So it, that's suggesting, oh, and indeed the sumpter horses were carrying large baskets across their back. And they had pressed 800 horses into their service out of the county of Midlothian alone. Wow. On the 30th, I'm not sure on the 30th of what, where are we? I'm not sure what that would be. The whole of the rebel army with the artillery and baggage consisting of 16 pieces of cannon, a number of covered wagons and about 100 laden horses were assembled around Manchester. Ah, that must be the 30th of November then. Wow, so 100, they got 100 pack horses with them, if we believe this, uh, even down in Manchester. The contributions levied upon the town amounted to 3,000 pounds and many of the horses within reach were put into requisition either to mount the cavalry or to convey the baggage. Right. What else do we have? Crossing Emont Bridge, now that's just south of Penrith, an observer noted 900 horses, 4,700 foot, I presume he means soldiers, of which 2,000 were good men. I don't know what that means. 63 carriages pulled by two to three horses, described as out of order and slender shaped. I think they're talking about the horses there <laughs> in a bit of a bad way. And uh, do I have the, the one more? Wait a minute. No, I've read that. That's right. Um, so, um, Frank, Mc, Frank, oh gosh, Frank McLean, no, McLean, that's it, Frank McLean in his uh, Jacobite army in England, he talks about how heavy uh, the carts were, the four-wheeled carts. And of course, Lord George Murray was really complaining, wasn't he, as the army retreated back towards Scotland and they're going back up through Shap. Apparently he is complaining that the four-wheeled wagons really can't take that road up to Shap. And he's asking that they use two-wheeled ones, which they eventually managed to find a few, apparently, um, at farms. But of course, the army had already gone through, hadn't they, once and probably stripped it of everything. Now they're retreating. It must have been very difficult indeed. Now, to find an image of one of these big carts, it's nearly impossible. But look, the Preston Pan's tapestry came to the rescue. They didn't have a pack horse but they did have one of these big carts. Can you see that? I can't imagine that going up over the old road to Shap. Now, I can tell you I've taken a pack horse on the old road to Shap, and I think, Stephen, you will have walked on the old road to Shap, won't you? And even today, it's a bit miry and boggy, and uh, <laughs> um, but I, I can imagine, uh, and indeed, the, you know, the writings of the, the time say, that the four wheel transport, um, yeah, it, it doesn't work very well. Now, one more image, perhaps the most exciting, because I, I found this a while ago and forgot about it, but uh, has anybody seen this before? It's uh, supposedly, uh, it's from the right period and it's Highland, it's the Highland army. It's actually showing all their tartans, but in amongst it, there's a cart, a bit like the one we've seen on the, the tapestry, but down on the bottom row, my goodness me, I don't know if you can see that, but we have a pack horse, just one. It seems to be carrying a tree on its back, but never mind. Uh, if anybody else can assist with any more information, well, I don't, ooh, I don't know, but... Um, I'm just about done. 
advantages of using pack horses over wheels. The, the big advantage is speed um, and the versatility that you can use minor tracks. Uh, pack horses are easier to maneuver around obstacles. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about the, um, the comments as, as the Jacobite army retreated, there are uh, writings in various books that refer to the roads having been dug up to try and delay by those who were not sympathizers, obviously. So trying to slow the army down and bridges being torn down. Now the, the bumpiness of the road wouldn't, well, it would slow the pack horses down a bit, but they could get through. But your wheel transport, as we know from what Murray was saying, it, it, it's very bad. Um, but speed of the essence. However, the disadvantages, the number of horses you need, <laughs> um, plus all the saddles, of course, and uh, and then if you think about the army were moving through this um, area in the winter time, um, so very very difficult to supply it, um, and uh, especially as they were retreating back over an area they'd already come through just a few weeks before, and stocks would have been depleted. Um, so all in all, yes, maybe I can understand why they were using carts but if only if only they could have um, perhaps employed some of these uh, pack horse trains that seem to have been so numerous and and gone hell for leather because of course although you'd have to you'd technically have more mouths to feed but if you're going to get from a to b more quickly then does that counsel it out i mean there are so many ifs and buts but it's a fascinating thought isn't it? <laughs> well, um, that's all I've got to say on that. If there are any questions, ooh, I will um, have a go answering them. <laughs>